Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, we have two feature stories for you. The term indoor agriculture conjures up greenhouses for many. In Chicago, they are actually growing microgreens and fish totally indoors. In our Southern Gardening segment today, Cleome. Some call them spider flowers, but regardless of the name, they are built for the tough Southern climate. In our first feature story, you'll meet Charles Dismukes, the 2011 Outstanding Mississippi Tree Farmer of the Year. Dismukes started tree farming as a teenager and later started his own timber attitude. business. Yes, that if they told me I wasn't going to live but two more weeks, I'd want to plant some trees before I left. And uh, if we don't do that, future generations won't have it. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford. Welcome to Farm Week. Today it's an all-feature story edition of our show. Leighton, our first story today profiles the 2011 Mississippi Forestry Association Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year. The call of forestry found Charles Dismukes of Kilmichael early in his life. He began tree farming at the age of 13, eventually followed a career that saw him own his own timber company and worked to further forestry on a local, state, and national basis. My management plan goes out 15 years now, from 2010. I updated it in 2010, and it goes out 15 years from now. Now, I have had some kind of a management plan since, uh, for at least 60 years. Charles Dismukes and his wife Carolyn live on their 1,158-acre registered tree farm northwest of Kilmichael, Mississippi. Mr. Dismukes grew up on the original 105 acres first purchased by his grandfather. Registered in 1959, the tree farm has trees ranging from just planted to more than 60 years. Dismukes has not only tree farmed, he also started the Vaden Timber Company, which his sons Barry and Brian operate today. Dismukes is also a registered forester in Alabama and Mississippi. He works to promote forestry at the local, state, and national levels. One of the quotes he, uh, he told me about is like, those that show up win. You have to be there in order to make things happen. So some just life skills that he is always sharing. Vicki Roberts of Winona is the current president of the Montgomery County Forestry Association. She started participating in the association 10 years ago after her father passed away and the family land was turned into a tree farm. At first glance, Roberts and Dismukes might not appear to have much in common but she considers him a mentor. We both have something in common. We both love land, and he's a good steward of the land, and his basic principles about life. You know, he's a big giver. I think that people won't, would not find that out from, from him because he doesn't like to talk about that. I have a vision for it, but he actually has the land where I can come and see the trails that he has on his property, the ponds. I can come see the visual of what I'm trying to do with the goals for our family property also. Roberts likes to read through Dismuke's 4-H youth record book because 4-H is where his forestry career started at age 13. It was in 51 and a new assistant county agent, Mr. Bob Wilson, came into this area and he was real enthusiastic with a 4-H club. Every, every school had a 4-H club in those days. He started to work on, on the kids around here and he looked at my place and he said, uh, Y'all don't farm much, so you need a forestry project. That led to forester Ralph Robertson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service helping the young Dismukes to formulate a tree management plan for 65 acres of his family's land. Field days were held at the property demonstrating proper tree planting and management. Dismukes' interest in forestry grew. He won the Mississippi and National 4-H Forestry Project Awards in 1957. That led to a four-year college scholarship from Homelight Chainsaws. Dismukes graduated with a forestry degree from Mississippi State University in 1961. Even in high school, Dismukes' reputation for forestry knowledge caused him to be called as an expert witness in a court case. 
And when I was 15 years old, I got a subpoena from, from a judge in Monona. And I was subpoenaed as an expert witness in a timber trespass case at 15 years of age. <laughs> and naturally, it, it kind of it, it was kind of getting to me. But I went over there, and I told them what I knew about timber and what I knew about trespassing. And I guess the guy, the guy won his case, and so I guess he was happy. <laughs> Dismukes continued to share his forestry knowledge while he operated his timber buying company. He tried to persuade every landowner he worked with to replant after the harvest. I always had a service if uh, I would make arrangements to get it tree planted and get the TSI with the site preparation work done. Now I didn't pay for it, but if he if he'd save enough money to do the paying, I would do all of the work for it, getting it replanted for him. And that still holds the day with my sons. If someone doesn't have a consultant forester of their own, I mean, we've always been, uh, uh, if they want to see, we'd be willing to advise them on uh, how to go about replanting and who to talk to and who to talk to in your extension service and your county foresters, and then they can give them all kinds of advice on that. Julian Watson, the 2009 Mississippi Forestry Association Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year, is a client of the Dismukes. For more than 10 years, their Vaden Timber Company is the only one he lets thin the trees on his home's county land. People say, well, why don't you get somebody else? I said, well, you know, uh, I'm very loyal. They've been loyal to me, and I'm loyal to them. They do a great job. Dismukes not only logged and tree farmed, he spent a lot of time after hours working on behalf of the forest industry. For example, he's a life member of the Mississippi Forestry Association and MFA's foundation. He served in many MFA roles, being an advocate for Mississippi forestry. In 2008, Dismukes received its highest honor, the Meritorious Service to Forestry Award. His active work to promote the forestry profession saw him declared a fellow of the Society of American Foresters, its highest honor. Locally, Dismukes is a member of three county forestry associations. Charles has been a member of just about every forestry organization I can think of, the Southern Hardwood Group, uh, SAF, MFA. He's a charter member of the Montgomery County Forestry Association and been the president two or three times. He has shared his knowledge with a lot of landowners, both in here in Montgomery County and in Carroll County also. Dismukes has also planted seeds for the future of forestry by donating to the College of Forest Resources at Mississippi State University. He funds a scholarship for an ambassador, a student who recruits other students into the college. What they needed was a, call it the ambassador scholarship. And actually they give the scholarship to students and these students in turn recruit other students for the forestry school. And I thought that was a good thing. My wife thought it was a really good thing, too. It was neat for me while I was at Mississippi State. Um, uh, I was an ambassador with the College of Forest Resources, and um, I received a uh, scholarship from, from a guy named Charles Desmukes. And uh, I knew he was from Vaden and, and was the owner of Vaden Timber Company. And uh, it's really neat now that I'm standing on his farm um, seeing, seeing what all he's done and getting to know him. The Dismukes family operates a multi-use tree farm where timber production, hunting, recreation, and education work together. It's not unusual to see groups ranging from homeschoolers to Boy Scouts on the Dismukes tree farm. This forestry class from Holmes Community College came recently for an opportunity to work in a managed forest. Field days are not uncommon for local landowners. The future looks promising for the Dismukes tree farm. It remains the center of family activity. One grandson is majoring in surveying while the other is majoring in forestry. He likes forestry and he likes wildlife, so he's trying to get that double major into that. So uh, he can, uh, he just likes being involved and I guess it's in the blood. I tell you my attitude is that if they told me I wasn't going to live but two more weeks, I'd want to plant some trees before I left. And uh, if we don't do that, future generations won't have it. You can watch this story again on Charles Dismukes on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube. The website address is farmweek.msucares.com. We'll also have links and contact information for agencies where you can get forestry advice to help you start to manage your tree farm. 
course, Leighton, that story was shot in September of 2011, which uh, means it's almost three years ago. Uh, we were surprised that he did not get National Tree Farmer Amazed of the Year. Amazed that we didn't, didn't get that. You know, because of, his, of what he did on his farm, how he helped other people. And he's a Society of American Foresters fellow, which they don't hand those out mm -hmm. every day. And not means, one on every corner, That no. means you've advanced, you know, the whole industry. So, but anyway, uh, one thing we might mention in that story, unfortunately, Jeff Crowder that you saw in that story that worked for the Forestry Commission has passed away uh, since that story was done originally. But uh, Charles Dismukes is uh, still going strong and uh, doing well. All right. Thanks, Ernest. Well, it's time now for today's trivia quiz on Farm Week, and the subject is corn. A lot of us will no doubt eat corn on the cob this summer. Next time, pay attention to the number of kernels. Our question today, how many kernels on the average ear of corn? Is the answer 220 or 440 or 600 or even 800 kernels? I'll have the answer after today's Southern Gardening segment. Are you looking for a tall flowering annual that likes the summer heat? Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman will show us how new varieties of Cleome can provide season-long color. One of the flowering plants I remember from my youth is Cleome. I loved the tall plants with the flowers that looked a little spidery. I still love the flowers, and these plants are perfect for our summer landscapes. Several years ago, a new and exciting Cleome was introduced. Senior reader Rosalita Cleome is a great garden and landscape plant, and it doesn't have thorns like the older varieties. This plant has been a strong summer performer all across the southeast. Flowers are produced freely all summer long. In 2009, senior reader Rosalita was selected as a Mississippi Medallion winner and has not looked back. Senior reader Rosalita does not produce viable seeds, so reseeding is not a problem. The growth habit is compact, with typical growth being 24 inches tall and 20 inches wide. In some locations, the plants may get a little larger. Another Cleome that is garden worthy are the sparklers available in white, pink, and lavender. Sparkler Blush Cleome was selected as an All-America Selections in 2002. These plants also have a bushy growth habit and will grow to about 36 inches tall. Sparkler has the potential to reseed, but the subsequent generations will likely resemble one of the breeding parents. Once the Cleome start to grow out, the plentiful flower heads may cause the branches to arch. Resist the urge to stake the taller varieties. The gentlest breeze can cause the arching branches to sway, adding movement to the landscape. Senior reader Rosalita and Sparkler Cleome add interesting textures to the garden for you and your neighbors to enjoy. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Cleomes are sometimes called spider flowers, Planting them in well-drained areas with full sun will help ensure your success. Well, it's time now for the answer to our trivia quiz today on Farm Week. Again, it's about the number of individual kernels found on an average year of corn. The answer is 800, according to foodreference.com. The average year of corn has these 800 kernels arranged in 16 rows. Some corn varieties have a different number of rows, but it is always an equal number. We're going to pause for a break now on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll add the calendar and one more feature story for you. Greens and gills. See how a business incubator in Chicago is growing vegetables and fish indoors all year round. love to be in the kitchen, whether it's helping to cook or enjoying a good meal. Kids want to be where the action is. A mini pizza is an easy recipe you and your children can prepare together. You can spark their imagination by experimenting with non-conventional crusts and creative toppings. Try using half of an English muffin, a flour tortilla, or even a thinly sliced portobello mushroom for the crust. Let the kids top the crust with tomato sauce and a sprinkling of low-fat mozzarella cheese. 
offer a variety of delicious fruits and veggies to top off their personalized pizzas with flair. Challenge them to make their own pizza masterpiece. Once their recipes are perfected, pop into the oven for a healthy afternoon snack. Most kids have a short attention span and they're probably going to make a mess. So be patient. You might just convince them to try something new. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Mississippi 4-H celebrates a rich history of youth development through creative hands-on experiences. Programs emphasize leadership, technology, science, and agriculture. But it's a lot more than that. making the best better. There's nothing like visiting a greenhouse in the spring for landscape inspiration. Here at JDS Nursery, Sandra Shawls and her crew are getting ready for the coming gardening season. One of the flowering plants that has left me in awe the past couple of years has been the Sinetti Paracallus. The flower colors can be almost iridescent. Colors include magenta, blue bicolor, and light blue bicolor. The bicolors are really pretty with their center white halos. One of the best attributes of Sinetti Paracallus is their love of the cooler temperatures of early spring. They will grow and flower when the thermometer is consistently in the 35 to 40 degree range but you'll have to protect or bring inside as these plants are not frost tolerant. Sinetti Paracallus can be used in the same way mums are used in the fall. They look great as a single container plant or even better as a combination container. Whichever way you display these colorful plants, take advantage of their reblooming capabilities. When the flowers are starting to fade, prune the plant back by 50%. In three to four weeks, new flowers will start to appear for a second show. Maintaining proper moisture level is important to good health for these plants. Wait until the potting media feels dry before watering. Once the heat of summer arrives, the flowering will stop, but you can maintain these plants over the summer and be rewarded with a burst of fall flowering. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Our last story today is about entrepreneurs pushing the envelope of innovative agriculture. For most people, when you mention indoor farming, they think of greenhouses or high tunnels. Well, two men in Chicago have built an aquaponics operation inside an old building on the south side of Chicago. Market to Market's David Miller says the operation goes by the name Greens and Gills. Snow on the ground in the Midwest is usually a clear signal that fresh, locally grown produce is no longer available. But for some residents of Chicago, the supply never dries up, even during the most inclement weather. On the south side of the Windy City, David Ellis and his business partner Eric Roth have joined several entrepreneurs who are pushing back against old man winter. This all started with a vision for capitalizing on a need in the marketplace, and that need was um, locally sourced produce. Um, what we saw was just that there was a, a demand for it, and that demand was only growing at an all-time high and only growing. And in the Midwest, the, the source for it was very minimal, almost non-existent, other than the summer months. So for a year-round uh, production company, there was uh, a gap in the marketplace that we felt we could capitalize on. To take advantage of that gap, the pair, along with a silent partner, invested more than $150,000 of their own money to market microgreens, leafy vegetables, and fish under the name Greens and Gills. Their secret weapon against bad weather stopping food production is aquaponics, a closed-loop system that uses water cycled between fish tanks and plant beds and to maximize the use of their 4,500 square feet of space, a portion of the product is grown on shelves, adding a vertical component to the operation. 
By being located in Chicago, orders for fresh greens can be filled in as little as a few hours, while the fish are ready for sale every six weeks. Selling the greens has actually been easier than the fish because chefs in the metropolitan area have difficulty balancing the purchase price against the cost of processing. Greens and Gills is the first licensed aquaponics farm in the city of Chicago and just celebrated its first anniversary in January. But long before the first pipes were connected, Ellis poured two years into research and development. The pair credits some of their success to a distinct division of labor. Roth handles nearly all of the production, while Ellis oversees the marketing. We felt that we needed to kind of check our egos at the door, realize that there's certain areas in business that we could, we excel at, and certain areas where we probably fall a little short. And the idea, and I think it's important for any business, is to be the, to recognize those and bring in the team that can really hit on all of Thanks, those man. areas. Yeah, see you tomorrow. The produce from Greens and Gill's vertical fields are marketed through a food distributor as well as directly to upscale restaurants located in Chicago's downtown business loop. Chefs sometimes can be hard to get in touch with, but it's on me to just cold call them. You know, I, I walk in the door, I come in with a cooler with microgreens and fresh cut basils and French sorrel and, and lettuces, and generally their, their first you know, inkling is uh, another vendor calling on me to try to get another product in here. But when I, my opening line is, I'm David Ellis, I co-own and operate an indoor urban farm right here in Chicago, they're usually pretty receptive to at least see what I have and do a tasting and, and talk from there. The chefs at Sienna Tavern were one of Greens and Gill's first customers. Texture, flavor, appearance, everything, start to finish, is phenomenal. They love to experiment and do new things. You know, so every now and then Dave will come around and it's just that it's that one-on-one -on -one interaction with the farmer that goes that much further. Greens and Gills is located in an unlikely place, the basement of a remodeled meatpacking plant. There are seven entrepreneurs like Ellis taking advantage of this green business incubator located on the south side of Chicago called The Plant. Uh, here in Chicago, the average vegetable has come maybe 1,500, maybe 2,000 miles to get here. Uh, that's silly. Uh, we have a talented workforce just on the other side of these walls. We have all of the resources that we need right here in Chicago, and this is where the food is consumed. So why are we transporting it? So the plant exists to figure out new ways to not only grow food in a city, but also how to process it in an efficient way. The plant is John Adel's second business incubator. A former television art director, Adel has devoted more than a decade to helping innovative entrepreneurs get their start. Adel's grand plan is to have the tenants create products, process the waste from those products, or provide power for the building in a closed energy loop. I never see a building as a dirty old building. Uh, I walked in and I saw the floor drains and I saw the concrete structure and I saw the beautiful brickwork and I said, well, you know, it, all the mechanical systems may be scrap metal, but you have the core, you have uh, some of the most expensive and important pieces. The concept of growing locally sourced food appealed to urban canopy owner Alex Polterak. The young entrepreneur began volunteering at the plant nearly four years ago and decided the innovative incubator would be a good place to start a business. After investing $100 in some wheatgrass seeds, Polterak began selling product out of his home to area juice bars. In 2011, he brought his new business to the basement of the plant and eventually moved upstairs to a 700 square foot vertical farming space. We call it a for-purpose business. So in the eyes of the IRS, it's still very much a for-profit business that they tax. But at the same time, the way we measure ourselves and what we try to do as a business is very much socially oriented. There's a purpose of how do we feed people, how do we create those economic benefits to the community, and how do we improve community wealth and health and stuff like that. So that's the purpose of the business. And how it Polterak handles how it all of the production and four full-time employees take care of distribution. He continues to sell wheatgrass to juice bars, while the rest of the products are sold to members of his community-supported agriculture project and a few restaurants. Polterak says Urban Canopy is making money, but the profits are plowed back into the operation. 
when I take a step back, I really love it. On a day to day, it's still very hard. Uh, and it is in this phase of, uh, of growth that's also difficult to manage. And for me, it's definitely very stressful and, um, and challenging to figure out. When I look back on what collectively our crew has accomplished over the last few years, it's, uh, it's astonishing. Um, and there's still a long, long way to go, so it's exciting to see. Polterac and Ellis plan to stay at the plant indefinitely to supply fresh, locally produced food to Chicago consumers year-round. But there is still plenty of space for a few more small businesses to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and help Adel get one step closer to his dream. For Market to Market, I'm David Miller. You can watch this story on Greens and Gills at the Farm Week website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. Well, for the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching today. We'll see you next week.